Welcome to Mount Sinai Future U, a show highlighting innovations and research at Mount Sinai that are changing patients' lives. Multiple myeloma is a complex blood cancer, and some patients receiving treatment become resistant to the drugs their doctors prescribe. But a new clinical trial is giving this group of patients a fighting chance, including one artist from Manhattan whose dream is to finish a painting that he's been working on for 40 years. That's an old sketch. Everything I was desperate to do something not to live. I'm not the, the, the Freddy type. What happens, happens. I was an artist. I got into painting, and I let a lot of paintings go. They wound up in a closet. I said to myself, what's the panic? When you're 65 or 70, finish them up. Just keep doing what you're doing. When I'm 65, then I got this news. And I said, whoa, I'm not going to be able to finish my work. Nick Palmisano had run out of treatment options. He was about to go into hospice care when he heard about a new clinical trial for late-stage drug-resistant multiple myeloma patients. Myeloma is a cancer of blood-forming cells and it's characterized by a relapsing clinical course. So patients initially get one set of drugs, and they relapse, we give them a different set of drugs, they relapse again, and so on and so forth. The problem that happens is at some point, they usually run out of FDA-approved treatment combinations, and then they come to us and we try to offer to them investigational drugs that are on clinical trials. We took a different approach than just using DNA sequencing. We also built on top a very unique feature, which was to look at the RNA of the patient's tumors. That can be used to interrogate a lot of known databases of drugs that have response in oncology and find treatment options out of the box that we have for myeloma right now. So using this approach of analyzing tumors by next generation sequencing, we then conducted a clinical trial. Majority of these patients had a significant response lasting for months. And remember, these are end stage patients. A lot of them were going to hospice. They would have not gotten any other treatment. Within a few months on the clinical trial, Nick went from being untreatable with high levels of cancer to going into remission giving him more of the most precious of commodities, time. So I built a port posy and I hope to leave this with some little nostalgia museum in New York. There's a few of them. It's from the Disney uh, Looney Tunes time, and even the name, Boop Loops, is taken from uh, names that appeal to kids like Betty Boop, Ali Oop. His only request to me when we started was that I want to keep painting. I have many paintings in my mind that I need to get out, so just keep me alive for a few months. And I'm so happy that he's still alive and painting. As a physician, it feels really important to be able to do this, to extend the lives of patients so that they get to their next milestones. We have patients live a life till their son gets married or their daughter graduates from college or the grandchild is born. These are all important milestones for us as physicians to help patients get to. With more time on his side, Nick says he'll be able to complete his final masterpiece, a painting that's been in the works for nearly four decades. It's up over my fireplace mantle, and it's a six by six foot painting. It's called Antiquities Last Stand, but it's all, it's symbolic. It's the new pushing out the old. This is the piece that I want to leave somewhere with somebody that they'll take care of. The Tisch Cancer Institute has a goal of advancing clinical breakthroughs to prevent and eradicate cancer. Recently, several of Mount Sinai's top cancer clinicians attended the annual meeting of the American Society of Clinical Oncology, where they discussed advancements in treatment. Tisch Cancer Institute at Mount Sinai is at ASCO. We have 100 oncologists at uh, the Tisch Cancer Institute at Mount Sinai, and many of them are here um, at the ASCO meeting in Chicago. Prostate cancer is a very common cancer, and the clinical trial that I'm the primary investigator on, studies called PRINT, instead of waiting for the cancer to become resistant to any one therapy before it becomes refractory to switch to a different type of a therapy, and in that way, we are trying to prevent the cancer from uh, mounting resistance to any one of these agents so that we can always go back to them in the future. 
So what's really been amazing about myeloma, it's not a very common cancer. So compared to the big four, breast, prostate, lung, and colon, myeloma is very uncommon. But in spite of that, there's been tremendous progress. The median survival for this cancer a few decades ago was probably around 20 months. And now there are actually a group of patients that we think we're already curing because they don't relapse in 10 years. So to have that kind of a progress in a relatively short time frame is amazing. And it's because of multiple new agents that have been approved. In the last decade, we've had about uh, 10 new drugs approved uh, in, in a relatively uncommon cancer. And I think that's a testament to patients being involved in clinical trials. I think our goal is to cure myeloma uh, for all patients, not just a small number, which we have so far. And the way we're gonna do that is by having novel clinical trials with novel agents, uh, genomic technology, immunologic technology, and the wealth of clinical experience of how to put that all together. So we certainly have a whole team multidisciplinary approach to taking care of patients with cancer. So it's not just the medical oncologist or the chemo doctor, but there's potentially the radiation doctor, there's the surgeon, then there's also social work that's an integral component to care to really get patients both to the services they may need that may be practical, like financial resources, transportation resources, but then also services just like psychiatric services. There are also integrative services like yoga therapy, massage therapy, pet therapy, art therapy, um, acupuncture, child life services that are available to patients who may need them. I think our immunology and immunotherapy program, the fact that we make vaccines, uh, that we have great clinical trials in, in immunology, is putting us and keeping us at the forefront of cancer research today. We're representing hematologic malignancy and also solid tumors. We're in the areas of targeted therapy and immune oncology, cellular therapy. So we have a great deal of expertise across the major new initiative areas, the, the, the cutting edge areas where, where uh, advances are being made. And it's a great opportunity to interact uh, with other, um, other clinician scientists and also uh, with pharmaceutical companies as we try to learn what, what are the next advances uh, that are on the horizon. Similar to multiple myeloma, men with prostate cancer can also become drug resistant. In this week's In Their Own Words segment, Dr. William O, oh, Chief of the Division of Hematology and Medical Oncology, talks about how rapidly cycling prostate cancer medications may help prevent drug resistance. We knew very little about how to treat cancers 20 years ago. Many cancers, if they weren't cured with surgery or radiation up front, unfortunately progressed and caused a lot of suffering. My own research interests particularly revolve around uh, prostate cancer. One of the things we know about the treatment of advanced prostate cancer is that patients do develop resistance to therapies despite the availability of more and more new treatments. Clinical trials are really what makes cancer care at Mount Sinai stand out. The idea was to use available treatments and rather than keep giving that drug until the patient develops resistance, to really switch therapies in a rapid succession with the hope that we can actually prevent resistance in these patients and really uh, get them to a longer disease control and potentially one day a cure. One of the things we recognize is that cancer is a very complex disease. Mount Sinai really offers uh, an outstanding environment for patients to uh, come for their care. It really allows us to take the information that comes from the laboratory, bring it immediately from bench to bedside to give advances to patients that need it. There's a lot of new things that we've learned even in the last few years that have helped my patients and I find that immensely gratifying. In the end, I think it sounds like a cliche, but I think we want to really go out of business as doctors. We want to be able to figure out how to treat and ultimately cure these cancers. Prostate cancer is one of the most common cancers. Last year in the U.S., 29,000 people died from the disease. Dr. Ash Tawari started the Mount Sinai Push-Up Challenge to draw attention to the link between physical fitness and prostate health. For the fourth year, Dr. Tawari kicked off the spirited competition, which included patients, hospital staff, and special guests.
Prostate cancer is one of the commonest cancers. It doesn't produce any symptom. Only way you can go after it, by being proactive. Last year itself, we lost 29,000 patients due to prostate cancer, just in the United States. So I want to bring a conversation back about prostate cancer and those 29,000 deaths. Men don't talk about it, but they can do push-up, they can help themselves by exercise, and also join the conversation about prostate cancer and exercise together. And that's the whole goal about this exercise. I had gone to my you know, general practitioner and my PSA had risen, um, and then I had seen a, a urologist on Long Island. I had done a biopsy with, with that urologist, and at that point it had come back that I had you know, cancer, and I had researched Dr. Tawari and a number of doctors in New York, and it was just, I was on board, I, you know, I had done my research, I had total faith and confidence in him, and it was just a matter of you know, having that connection with both of us that this is what we needed to do. I like the way he came across uh, as a person and as a doctor. I felt comfortable with him, of course. And talking to him and how the surgery was gonna go and what was he planning on doing. And everything turned out to be smooth and just right. And it's not just Dr. Tawari, it's all of the people that, that work with him that are really wonderful people that give you all of the information you really want and need. He has one of the best staff out there. I mean, they treat you with respect and treat you like a human being. You can't ask for anything better than that. Obviously, I still have a continuing relationship with Dr. Tawari for follow-up and treatment if that's going to be necessary here in the future. I'm here to testify, so to speak, you know, to all of the, the great things that they did for me um, to give me a chance, which is really all you can ask for when you, you, know, you get hit with a diagnosis like this. Always going to support the people that supported and helped me. This is a very important uh, event. prostate cancer, so thank you for all of you coming. I look forward to everybody participating, and let's see how many I can do this year. In this week's segment of Alumni Pride in celebration of the 50th anniversary of the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai, we're introducing you to Dr. Barry Salke, Chief Emeritus of the Division of Laparoscopic Surgery. Dr. Salke pioneered minimally invasive surgical techniques and is grateful to Mount Sinai for allowing him to contribute to medical history. I sort of got into medical school, medical, the whole business of medicine, uh, not quite on a dare, but a couple of my good friends sort of pointed me to, you know, maybe I should give uh, pre-med a try. It was almost a little bit on a lark. Uh, and as it turned out, I uh, made a very, very good decision. But who knew I was going to really like that? I arrived here in 1971. They actually didn't have even a full school at that point. We all know the history of um, medicine and surgery that nothing stays static. And I was fortunate enough to fall within that time period where we were developing a real revolution in in surgery. We were taught as surgeons to make big incisions so we can get great exposure to do the things we want to do safely. And when uh, I realized that through a uh, half inch incision I could do exactly the same thing for many patients, it was uh, mind boggling. The progression of uh, minimally invasive surgery at Mount Sinai is really what I consider my greatest achievement. Mount Sinai uh, established this division of minimally invasive surgery, which I was fortunate enough to head. And that division was one of the first ones in the country, uh, and it was very, very key in helping develop minimally invasive techniques from 1992 onward to even today. To have been part of it, uh, that development at uh, this uh, great institution has been uh, really a, sort of a feather in my cap really makes me feel like I've contributed to the uh, development of surgery here at Mount Sinai. Mount Sinai was the greatest thing that ever happened to me. Happy anniversary to Icon School of Medicine. 50 years is pretty good. Keep going. Minimally invasive techniques are used in many disciplines, including brain surgery. Dr. Alfred Illoretta is a head and neck surgeon who places an endoscope through the nose as a pathway to reach areas of the brain that are otherwise difficult to treat. 
Dr. Illoretta recently performed surgery on a patient who thought he was suffering from allergies following years of being misdiagnosed. That is, until a CT scan revealed a brain leak. On my worst day, I felt defeated. I feel as if my body is just slowly deteriorating and there's nothing I could do about it because I'm, who else have a runny nose that just comes out of nowhere? I'd get up in the middle of the night and you know, the, the pillow would be wet from my nose leaking. I didn't know what was going on. I got scared last Thanksgiving when I was preparing a meal and um, it came out of nowhere and it just added itself into the ingredients. So I'm like, oh God, I can't feed this to nobody. So it just ruined my Thanksgiving dinner. I went to at least five doctors and everybody misdiagnosed it. They diagnosed me with pneumonia, bronchitis, annual allergies, and I tried everything, nothing worked. And from then I said, you know what? Let me do a little bit more research. Feeling much better, which will happen. So Greg right. came to us complaining of clear rhinorrhea or a runny nose from one side of his nostril with a salty taste as well as some associated headaches. When we saw the scans, there was no question that there was a leak or hole between the brain and the nose, which was leaking fluid persistently, especially when he was bending over, doing work. This condition is called a cerebral spinal fluid leak. It's a very rare condition, but it usually presents to other people with drainage from the nose, as well as post-nasal drip, much like allergic rhinitis or common allergies. I was living with this problem for five years. I didn't realize how dangerous this stuff was because this could lead to you getting meningitis. And that's deadly. When I found out that I had to have brain surgery, it was scary. It really was because I've never had surgery before. I never had no kind of surgery. When you think brain surgery, you think they're going to just take the top of your head off and go in there and do the repairs. But no, they did it minimally invasive. They went up and they did the repair. I didn't even know anybody was out there. So in this procedure, we did not use any incisions on the face or in the abdomen or anywhere in the body. We used cameras essentially on a long stick that we put through the nose with specialized instruments to expose the hole in his skull. And then we repaired it using his own tissue. By using his own tissue, it heals much better, faster, and we're not putting foreign bodies into the nose or brain that could lead to infection later on. And now I'm like a new man. You know, I feel like a million dollars. I could breathe again. You wouldn't even know you had surgery. You go in, next thing you know, you out. He was able to leave the hospital the next day, and that's how efficient the surgery is and less invasive it is than previous techniques that were used. It's amazing to be part of a hospital system in which we are able to use cutting edge tools such as navigation, fusion of different imaging modalities and virtual reality to provide the patient with the safest, most efficient and effective surgery. Feels good. <laughs> It really does. I'm the home cook, so it's going to give me some pleasure when I get back home to finish that Thanksgiving dinner, you know? <laughs> yeah, I might even do a special one this Thanksgiving. <laughs> New personalized vaccines targeting deadly forms of cancer are among the latest developments in immunotherapy. Dr. Nina Bardwaj is developing vaccines in a clinical trial that uses the genetic sequence of a patient's tumor to create a customized version that will attack cancer mutations. Thomas Kilgannon, a dentist who lives in New Jersey, had his voice box removed following a cancer diagnosis. He shares how Dr. Bardwaj's clinical trial is helping him fight the disease. So I went from being having no trouble healthy my whole life to, you know, a cancer patient, you know. I never smoked in my life, never, you know, lived a pretty good life, been healthy as always. So it was a bit of a shock, I have to say, you know. I had a little, uh, a little cough and a little, um, just a little bit of always voice. So I got it checked out by some ENTs and uh, after a little while I finally uh, ended up down here at Mount Sinai. And it ended up being, um, you know, a keratinizing squamous cell of the vocal cords. So it was, uh, again, a lot to deal with, you know, but I still, I needed the, uh, I needed the 
did the surgery. There you are, just did the tumor. Right then and there, they took it down for study, DNA sequencing, and, and all these fancy things. They asked me to do the study. That's when I met Dr. Bargwa and Dr. Freelander. Hello, how are you? We started initially with treating patients who have melanoma, which is a type of skin cancer. But we have since broadened our treatments to patients with other solid tumors. For example, head and neck cancers, ovarian cancer, breast cancer. We have a few different strategies to treat them. This includes dendritic cell-based vaccination or cell-based vaccination, antibody targeting uh, in patients, and more recently, the development of a personalized cancer vaccine for patients. This vaccine is a, is a personal, it's my own personal vaccine derived from that particular tumor. And it's both the idea being to alert the immune system that if this ever recurs, that the immune system is ready to, to eliminate it. We're encouraged in that in some of our trials, we have seen clinical responses. Um, we have seen immune responses. And our future trials, we will combine some of these vaccine therapeutic approaches with newer immunotherapies. This also is a blessing. It may, it may help me, and it may help thousands of people beyond this point. So we got to start somewhere, why not here? I really feel that Tish Cancer Series is poised uh, and has the cutting edge technology and vision to take advantage of these new discoveries and to make our own discoveries to make life much better for cancer patients in the future. How are antimicrobial proteins found in the gut linked to bone marrow transplants? In our next story, Dr. James Ferrara at the Tisch Cancer Institute shares how the lining of the gastrointestinal tract is leading to a new class of drugs. My laboratory studies graft-versus-host disease, or GVHD, which is a deadly complication of bone marrow transplantation. Patients with gastrointestinal GVHD often have the most severe form of the disease, and up to 50% of them may die. My colleagues and I created the Mount Sinai Acute GVHD International Consortium, or MAGIC, to study this deadly complication. There are over 20 centers around the globe, and in this study, we studied almost 150 patients from centers in the United States and Germany. We found that an antimicrobial protein called Regenerative 3-alpha, or Reg3, that's made in the GI tract increases in the bloodstream of patients who have gastrointestinal GVHD. In a surprising paradox, the specialized cells that make Reg3 are actually destroyed as its serum concentration increases. We studied this paradox in several mouse models of graft-versus-host disease. In a GI biopsy from a mouse without graft-versus-host disease, Reg3, shown in brown, is abundantly expressed in almost all of the cells of the epithelium. But in a biopsy from a mouse with graft-versus-host disease, the Reg3 expression is very dim and, and hardly expressed at all. Further studies show that this protein helps gastrointestinal cells grow under sterile culture conditions in vitro. Thus, we have discovered an entirely new function for this antimicrobial protein of the innate immune system. It actually helps uh, intestinal stem cells to thrive. So now, when a patient has GVHD, the only medicines that are effective suppress the immune system. They're called immunosuppressants. So in, in some <laughs> autoimmune diseases like inflammatory bowel disease, we know that the intestinal stem cells are also affected. So this now suggests that there's an entirely new strategy of helping those patients to repair their GI tracts. In our final story of the broadcast, we take you to the Center for Carcinoid and Neuroendocrine Tumors at the Tisch Cancer Institute, where researchers are developing new imaging and diagnostic procedures for treating tumors in the gastrointestinal system. Neuroendocrine tumors are 
a type of cancer that starts from endocrine cells in the body. That's a very complex group of cancers. It's also the fastest increasing kind of cancer in America. The Center for Carcinoid and Neuroendocrine Cancers has become a national and international destination for patients with neuroendocrine tumors and carcinoid tumors. And I am privileged and honored to be the director of such a center. I'm going to bring a lot of clinical trials involving new biologic agents, immune therapy, targeted radiation therapy, new approaches to multidisciplinary care. We are very excited about Dr. Ed Wollen joining the Tisch Kamps Institute at Mount Sinai. We have built a spectacular cancer program, a research and clinical program. One of the ways we've done that is to get expertise within different disease areas. We have tremendous neuroendocrine surgeons and uh, gastroenterologists and radiologists and nuclear medicine doctors and cardiologists and all different specialties where people are able to work together and to treat cancers that are complex, but providing new leadership and providing a medical oncology input to bring new therapies and to coordinate therapies, I think will help bring the program to the next level. Thank you for watching Mount Sinai Future You. Be sure to follow us on Facebook and Twitter for updates on our next episode.